So there it is. Anyway, we're going to talk about some serious issues today. Uh, last week I was just tapping you on the nose, softening you up. Today it's like going into the ring with Muhammad Ali. I, I'm going to hit you below the belt. Okay. It's going to be about science, society and responsibility. And this is the talk that I really would want you to think about very much. First of all, about science itself. It starts early. How many of you actually had this toy when you were small? Who didn't have this toy? Can I see it? Oh, you poor disadvantaged little <laughs> But anyway, there was this one little kid who shall be nameless. Every time he picked up the cube, he tried to put it through the round hole. It didn't matter what he picked up, he tried to put it through the round hole. And his mum realized if this went on, he wasn't going to get to FSU. He <laughs> might get to the University of Florida, but not to FSU. <laughs> anyway, to cut a long story short, uh, his mum decided to take him to see a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist he said, you know, don't worry. The way I look at it, it doesn't matter what the problem is, this kid will only see one solution. And there's a perfect career for a kid like that, and that's to be a politician. Okay. <laughs> anyway, to cut a long story short, that's a very important toy because it gives you a feeling for shapes and patterns. And as you get older, those are the most important issues that you use your, your eyes and ears to look at patterns. The other thing I had, which I didn't mention last week, I had a Meccano set. And I made things, and Meccano was basically invented in 1900, and in 1913, Gilbert actually rejigged the holes and things like this, so he didn't have to pay the Brits for a patent, and it became a rector set. How many of you had a rector set? That's pretty good, actually. I discovered that 96 to 98 percent of British engineers had Meccano, and I think it's an important toy, much better than, um, than Lego. Anyway, here's an ad which gives you an idea of what ads were like in those days. Whimsical, no violence, but of course nowadays we've got to add girls, okay? And are keen, ambitious, and inventive. No boy, or girl, <laughs> follows the Makana hobby can be a bad boy, or bad girl. And in fact, kids just love playing with this, putting nuts and bolts together. And I think the ability to put a screw and a bolt together is one of the most in, in, important things that you learn from this sort of kit. And my, my world <clears throat> as a kid was put together with nuts and bolts, and now it's put together with electrons and atoms. So that's one thing. The other thing is I used to have a, a camera, and I want to show you what it was like in those days. <coughs> had to have a good incentive, and that was one of mine, and here and she's in the audience at the front. Okay, but today, all you need to do is that. And you've lost a lot. You don't, many of you don't, in fact, I don't know what's going on inside there. I knew every aspect. I understood something about um, the inverse square law, reciprocity failure, the chemistry that was involved, what was going on when photons hit the thing. What's more, I could, I knew every aspect of the production of the process. Now, this epitomizes the world you are in, that most of you are using technology that works very efficiently. When it doesn't, when it doesn't work efficiently, you have to throw it away and replace it. So you're growing up in a world with a technology which you don't fully understand, and I think that is a problem. However, the other aspect is I want to discuss 1% of the population created the modern world. And I want you to understand that which, a bit of the way that 92% more, basically, nine out of ten of them actually think. Well, what did the chemists create? Let's just take all these away. And in fact, physicists, engineers can actually say much the same, that they did very much of that kind. And who are these 1%? Well, let me just tell you, because it's misunderstood who they are. When you look in sort of the literature, you get pictures like this. I know it looks like me, okay? <laughs> but all like that, okay? Crazy scientists. 
And who's responsible for this? Well, some of you might recognize. <laughs> but in fact, many people will look at this. Now, does anybody think they know what this guy did? Shout out. E yeah. equals MC squared. Okay, well, you're wrong. He's an imposter. Because he didn't do that. The person that did it was this guy. Yes, Young Einstein. In fact, it's very important to realize that he was 17 when he was first starting to write letters about what it would be like to travel at the velocity of light. In fact, someone told me he was 13, you are scientists now, you are the creators now, because it's very important what you do now. Because if you don't do it now, you will not be creative, and we need creative people. In fact, it's, you have this picture, that wasn't the Darwin that created this fantastic book. It was young Charlie at the age of 24. Clark Maxwell, who changed all our understanding of electricity and magnetism in these four equations, made the biggest breakthrough of the 19th century. He was weak, Jamie, with a little quiff on the top of his head. <laughs> Rosalind Franklin took the most important photograph of all time. This photograph led to the structure of DNA. That molecule will present you, people in the future, with massive societal problems. And I don't think society has the wisdom to know how to handle that knowledge. Chandra Seker was a young man when he re realized that a star one and a half times the size of the sun would collapse into a neutron star. It's young people who actually are the creative ones. Unfortunately, you've got this guy, and he's a Scientologist. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jim Heath, Sean O'Brien, Yuan Liu, and Jonathan Hare are the young students and graduate students who actually worked with us on the discovery of C60. I'm going to talk about them and what they did with us on the in the fourth lecture. Okay, science of the 21st century. I can't tell, do it all in one lecture. What exactly are nanoscience and nanotechnology? Well, it's self-assembly, understanding how assembly, assembly works, okay? One might wonder, is it possible to create a computer by chemistry? Well, look what's already been created. That has been created by nanotechnology, bottom-up assembly. In fact, it's interesting to think about genetic engineering. Genetic engineering is not new. It's very old. Humans have actually engineered this animal into a chihuahua. Now, they're the same basically animal, the same genes. The point about it is that we can probably do that in one step now instead of over a thousand years. In fact, we can probably change a human being into a chihuahua, okay? And there are a number of them that I suggest we actually do that for. <laughs> okay. But a good definition of nanotechnology is atom by atom, molecule by molecule assembly of a complex or functional system. And by that definition, you are the results of nanotechnology, protein assembly, protein by protein, into what you are. It's not new. It's as old as the hills. Just a little bit about this work that I've been doing here with um, Naresh Dalal. And looking at this ferrite core memory, this is a very interesting one because if you pass the current, just half the current you need to magnetize that ferrite core, and the other half at the same time through that one, you magnetize that core, okay? And here is the old ferrite core memories, 1,024 bits. It was about 11, uh, 11 times 11 centimeters, 121 centimeters in, in area. And if we blow it up, we see what it was. These were handmade. These were the first storage assembly units. But what we're doing is somewhat similar, but trying to do it by chemistry. Instead of stitching it together by hand, can we actually stitch it together by chemistry? And with Prashant Jain and Naresh Dalal and Tony Cheatham, we've got the first rung on a very, very steep ladder. Okay, and if we can do that, what we can achieve is basically, because this is about one nanometer as opposed to one millimeter, which is a factor of 10 to the minus 7, then we should be able to put 10 to the 14 storage elements where in the former ferrite core memories there was only essentially one. Okay? And we, as I say, we've not got very far, but we're getting a little bit on that, sort of that road. Now, my favorite molecule is not C60. My favorite molecule is nitrose or ethane. And you might wonder why, but not when you see this model. <laughs> what does it look like to anybody? Yeah, it's my dog, made of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, okay, red nose, okay. <laughs> we look at the microwave spectrum, which is what I used to do, we realize the dog shakes its head, okay, and it looks at its tail. 
Not only that, okay, my dog can do some other things as well. And here it can go and undergo internal rotation, okay. It's been drinking, it's an underage dog, and a bit of drinking on the side, okay. And, but when you've been drinking, you know what the problem is, that you desperately need a lamppost. Okay. <laughs> the molecule does that, and I want to think about it, that molecules are not just that structure you write on a paper, it, they're flexible. And in the 21st century, that flexibility will be important. Okay. This is an amazing molecule. Max Perot's got the Nobel Prize for showing that hemoglobin was a molecular machine. It was the first molecular machine that was recognized. As you sit here in the audience, your hemoglobin is capturing oxygen, okay, and transporting it to where it's needed. The most amazing for me is ATP synthase. On the mitochondria, these little blitches, blips, and if you look at them, you see them around here. And what you have is an amazing electric motor. And just look at this fantastic machine. In your body, this machine is taking protons onto this wheel, turning it round, opening and shutting these cavities. ADP, adenosine diphosphate, is going in and ATP is coming out. As you sit here, millions and zillions of electric motors inside your body, driven by protons and not electrons, are actually making the ATP so that you can function. That is the storage of energy in your body. Here's the rotor, okay? And what is happening is basically a proton is um, neutralizing a negative moiety and turning it around. I think Faraday would have been absolutely excited to see that life had actually created a real electric motor long ago. And here we see a TP coming out. There's a little bit of a, something from Wikipedia which shows you what's actually going in. ADP going in and then put together with phosphate and then being kicked out. I just love this thing, and I just go back to when I was a kid with this little Meccano clockwork motor and my electric train. It takes me back. I want to play with this nanoscale machines. And you have these now to play around with and create new devices. It's such an exciting time. The other thing about science is it's international. Well, this is perhaps the most important thing that I have to say for you. If you are and become a scientist, you will have friends throughout the world, as long as you don't publish the same work as they do. All right. <laughs> but it doesn't matter what country it is, what nationality they are, what the religion they have, what race they are, you will have a, a brotherhood and sisterhood of people who think the same way as you do. And in fact, Pasteur is rather good at quotations, and you know from last week that I love quotations. In the field of observation, chance favors only the prepared mind. Let me tell you the secret that has led me to my goal. My strength lies solely in my tenacity. It is surmounting difficulties that make heroes. But my favorite is this one. Science knows no country because knowledge belongs to humanity. And it is the torch which illuminates the world. Science is the highest personification of the nation because that nation will remain the first which carries the furthest the works of thought and intelligence. I like that statement more than the others. Society, this is where the difficulty lies. For me, a nine out of 10 top scientists. The perspective of 90% of the community that created the modern world. And I want you to think about this article. Please look at this article. It's on my Vega website. If you put Vega Science into Google, you'll come up with my website. And there's a fantastic article, Scientists as Citizens, by John Cornforth. This article, has really affected me from, from the moment I read it. Full of wisdom of a man who's been deaf since the age of 18, but overcame all that, he's now 94, to become a Nobel Prize winner. He's one of the, just a very small number of geniuses, two, three, or four that I've ever met. Also, a very short book by Feynman, The Meaning of It All. I think in the second chapter, it applies to me and a few other people. I remember, as I said before, um, I'm not here to make you feel comfort, comfortable. I'm here to make you think. So what about science? Well, there are several aspects of science. One is it's a body of knowledge. <clears throat> the second is the application of that knowledge, technology, what we see around us. The ways in which that knowledge was discovered, the scientific method. How was it done? How did the 
discover this, the way the universe works? How did we work out how to make all this stuff? It really only started about 500 years ago. However, there's something far more important. Because the contributions of science to society have been so, have so revolutionized our lives, we forgot the most important aspect of science. And particularly politicians. They don't think science is useful or important unless it's useful. The most important aspect of science is encapsulating the fact that it had another name. It was called natural philosophy. And the most important aspect by far is that natural philosophy is the only philosophical construct we have devised to determine truth with any degree of reliability. I'm going to say it again. Natural philosophy, I'm going to define it as the only philosophical construct or the philosophical construct we have devised to determine truth with any degree of reliability. And if that is so, the ethical purpose of education must involve the teaching of young people how you can decide what you're being told is actually true. I don't think anyone can really argue with that. Thus the teaching of a skeptical evidence-based assessment of all claims, without exception, is an intellectual integrity issue that every teacher should address. Without evidence, anything goes. Think about it. And I am one of the group of people who think that's the most important. Another quotation, the great enemy of the truth is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived, dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. Belief in myths allows the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. Fantastic line. It allows the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. And you may be surprised who said it. It was one of your presidents. Well, I love this particular woodcut by Dürer. And I see the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Okay. Here it is. What are they? There are more than four. Anti-science, sustainability, mystical and political dogma, nuclear proliferation. We're going to discuss those. If we want world peace, it's a global citizenship issue. And it confronts us, and we must confront it. Anti-science. Well, some of you may know Trentlot. At the time he said this, he was Senate Majority Leader. Okay, welcome back. We're ready to resume our discussion of the 105th Congress during your visit here for inauguration. And uh, we're very pleased to have with us the Senate Majority Leader, Trent Lott of Mississippi, if you'd help us welcome Thank, Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Good morning. I would like to know what advice would you give to a prospective student who is interested in following a career path similar to a senator? Similar to a senator? Yes. Well, first of all, I want to encourage you to take maximum advantage of your educational opportunities. Uh, we live in a great country. We have a, a great educational system that's not perfect. Uh, we spend an awful lot of money that doesn't always give us the results that we want. But I can assure you, whatever you want to do in life, uh, education will help you get a faster start. For instance, um, when I was in high school, if you were in the so-called pre-college uh, curriculum, you had to take four years of science and four years of math. A waste of my time, a waste of the teacher's time, and a waste of space. You know, I, I took physics. For what? Uh-oh, <laughs> uh every physics teacher in America is out to lynch me. Physics is great, and I think we need the best possible physics teachers and the best uh, students in physics we can get if you're going into physics or mathematics or science or medicine. But if you want to be a lawyer, and you know that's where you're headed, maybe you'd be better off taking an economics course, a typing course, a computer course, or music, for heaven's sake, because it's good for the soul. Uh, <laughs> now, there are a number of things to see about that. The first thing he stopped and milk the audience. He'd done it before, and he waited for that reaction. What I think you should watch is the way that almost everyone, except one girl, was laughing and cheering and clapping. And then at the end, he said, take music because it's good for the soul. Well, you know, if he had to have his foot cut off, I think he would require preferably an anesthetic rather than music. I think the point is, that's an example of politicians today. He's not the only one. 
Not only politicians, but large numbers. And I'm really proud of you because essentially I don't see anyone laughing and cheering at that. Okay. Because that's a problem of today and technology is so powerful. Anyway, that was anti science. And it leads to things like this. I'm going to talk about chemistry. Chemistry in 30 seconds, okay? You think you might need years, but I'm going to do it in 30 seconds. The Earth orbits the Sun. We use classical mechanics. And lettering, orbiting a nucleus, we use quantum mechanics. And in quantum mechanics, it tells us that only certain orientations of a spinning nucleus or an electron are allowed. Okay, so just a few of them are allowed. Certain orientations. And argument is quantized. J is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Some of you will learn this. And when J has a certain value, there are two J plus one orientations. When J is zero, two J plus one is one, one orientation. When J is one, two J plus one is three. And when J is two, two J plus one is five. Hence, my th boxes, okay? Now then, what I'm going to do is I'm going to double them up, okay? Move this to there and this to there. Double that set, double that set, double that set, and become there and that's there. And what have we got? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Based on the numbers one, three, and five. It explains the whole of chemistry, all of life, and all the useful bits of physics, if any. <laughs> I'm a chemist, I have to dig at the physicists. Of course, the physics is the overarching science of everything. And chemistry is that massive part of physics which applies to us. The chemistry that goes on, the biology and things of this nature. And it's based on the numbers one, three, and five. And when I realized that, I just thought, isn't that fantastic? That the periodic table is based on it like that. In fact, Mendeleev really made the big breakthrough in chemistry. Because as they laid this out in this old periodic table, he realized that there should be a missing point here. Other people had seen this, but they didn't do what Mendeleev did. And he predicted that there would be an element there who was carbon, silicon, and the eco-silicon was germanium. Now that's science. To take an observation, have a theory, and then make a prediction. That's why Mendeleev was a great man. And to some extent, I show this because some of you, I think there's a lecture tomorrow on the Higgs boson, if you want to know a bit about it in physics. It, there was a missing piece, and that's why a lot of money was spent in trying to find it. There are three senses, okay? The first one is common sense. Common sense tells us that the sun goes around the Earth. Who agrees with me? Common sense. I don't know. You've seen it. It's there in the morning. It's over there at night. It's going round us. It's uncommon sense. That tells us that the Earth is turning on its axis, which makes it seem as though the sun is going round us. And that's the uncommon sense and bravery of Copernicus, Galileo, and Giordano Bruno, who was burnt to death. Okay. I don't want to watch the film again. I've seen it one time. It's the end of the film on Giordano Bruno. Most people have accepted the claim that the Earth goes around the sun without knowing what the evidence is. How many people know the evidence, for instance, that the Earth is turning on its axis, apart from me? Not many. I want you to think about this. So most of you have accepted this without knowing the evidence. You haven't checked. So the question now is, what else have you accepted without knowing the evidence? This is probably one of the most important things I want you to think about. Who knows the evidence? What else have you accepted? And many, many, many people have accepted claims for which there is no evidence. And that, I believe, is a massive problem. Especially, as we shall see at the end of this lecture, in a time of weapons of mass destruction. So that's it. Let me show you a bit of creativity. It's the, what I call the Kentucky Fried Creation Museum in Cincinnati. Busloads of children are going into this museum and other groups as well. They have signs, did humans live with dinosaurs? God made Adam and Eve on the same day as land animals, so dinosaurs and people lived at the same time. If that is true, we probably put saddles on them. <laughs> what did dinosaurs originally eat? Before Adam sinned, all animals, including dinosaurs, were vegetarian. Okay. <laughs> you don't need those teeth for salads, I'll tell you. <laughs> what happened to the dinosaurs that didn't go into Noah's Ark? They were drowned in the flood 4,350 years ago, and many were buried and preserved as fossils. There's a Noah's Ark there, too. And here is Noah. He's a Scot. 
There's a big fluff coming up. We got to build a big fluff. And here's a little girl scratching her head because she doesn't know what to believe and what to accept. But let's think about this. When I was at school, I noticed that South America and Africa fitted together. I was topping geography. It was the one thing that I could be topping. And I just loved the subject. And in my lifetime, we discovered that they once did fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. Here's a wonderful sort of uh, animation of this by a school. And we know, no, 230 million, 230 million years ago, after the Triassic period, um, they drifted apart. Now then, not only that, we can look at the, the mid-Atlantic trench, and we've got a, a magnetic tape recording which, in which the um, direction of the Earth's magnetic field has been laid down as it's changed backwards and forwards. So what's under the sea it fits as well with that. Therefore, the animals that roamed South Africa and South uh, Africa and South America should have been the same, and they are. The fossils in those times, in the Triassic period, actually are the same. There's more evidence for evolution than anything in the whole of the sciences. And it doesn't just come from paleontology and fossils. It comes from every walk of the sciences. The attack on evolution is attack on the scientific community, every one of you. And you should think about it. Our cousins, I love this animal. It's obviously, well, Mark, it's obviously a Bolton football supporter just been beaten by Manchester United. But look at the face, the humanity in that face. I'm proud to be 90%, that 99% of my genes are the same as this really fantastic animal. Probably in Italian football school, <laughs> just beaten by England or whatever. 70% of the guys, this guy's genes are the same as ours. 50% the same as a fruit fly. And the magus as well. And my favourite is 70% of your genes the same as a pumpkin. And the evidence is the average politician. <laughs> There's more evidence for evolution than any truth that we have discovered. There's a nice cartoon by Doonesbury. Oh, my God. are you sure? Afraid so, but we caught it early. So my prognosis is it good. Depends on whether you're a creationist. Well, yes, I am. Because I need to know whether you want me to treat the bug as it was before antibiotics or the multiple drug resistant strain it has since evolved into. Evolved? Your choice. If you go with the Noah's Ark version, I'll just give you the streptomycin. Um, what are the newer drugs? They're intelligently designed. <laughs> as do as well. Actually, I have a favorite story. Okay. Simon the Wanderer, sole survivor of the human race, travels the universe to find out with a dog, uh, an owl, and a mechanical lover, which apparently goes wrong most of the time. Um, the searching for the answer to why we are created only here, only to suffer and die. He meets Bingo, a hoary old cockroach, and tells him that uh, humans are an experiment evolved from cockroach crap. <laughs> Simon asks why on earth did they do this terrible experiment, which has meant so much pain and agony to zillions of humans. Why, why, why? And Bingo says, why not? <laughs> it's the best answer I've come across to the meaning of life myself when I think about it. Big Bang Theory, well, we've got some evidence. Okay, 10 to the minus 43 seconds, 10 to the minus 32 seconds, the temperature 10 to 37K, 10 to the minus 6, a millionth of a second, 10 to the 13K, 3 minutes, 100 million, 100 million. Um, Kelvin. <clears throat> the first atoms after 300,000 years, the first stars after a billion years, and where we are now after 14 billion years, temperature of 2.73 Kelvin. The evidence for the three degree background. Climate change. Well, you know that's a vexed problem. Don't accept what I say. Don't accept what anyone says. Look at the evidence. Ask yourself, is there more or less rainfall? Are the temperatures rising? Are the glaciers receding? Is sea level rising? Animals, are they moving from their habitats? What's about the CO2? Look for evidence that would be useful for you to decide, okay? Check it out. Take no one's word for it. Decide for yourself. Don't take a scientist's word. Check it out. Because people are trying to actually tell you that things are not the way they are. I have a four out of five rule. It's my four out of five rule of scientific method, okay? 
If you make a new observation, develop a hypothesis to explain it. Then test the hypothesis with a few experiments. Five would be good. If four observations out of five fit, you're almost, accents on almost, certainly right. If only one out of five fits, you're almost, accents on almost, certainly wrong. And that works for me. And if you do a bit of statistical analysis with reasonable input data, you have a 99.9% .9 probability that your hypothesis is correct with four out of five. <clears throat> Sustainability. This is a serious problem. And saving the planet will require some technical fixes. Okay. What about sustainability? Well, certainly, I think we should actually look at it very carefully and do some fundamental work in this. And science, chemistry, and physics will be very important. Nanosciences as well. Maybe the only show in town. Three high sustainability technologies. Splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen. Efficient solar electricity production. Genetically develop a wheat that can fix its own nitrogen. Something like 8 to 10 percent of the oil resources go on producing nitrogen fertilizers, which feeds 70 percent of the planet. It doesn't realize it. And such things, of, um, such as tractors going backwards and forwards, producing this whole thing. Those are some of the issues. I haven't got time to talk about water splitting at the moment. My favorite animal is actually the dung beetle. And you know what it's sitting on? It's that's a ball of elephant crap. And if there were no dung beetles, we would be about 50 to 100 feet deep in elephant crap because they're recycling it. But what are we deep in? We're deep in our own crap. This is a field in England with 140,000 refrigerators, okay? Just left there, not being recycled. And I, as you know from last week, I do logos, and so here's my logo for sustainable <laughs> We have to learn to recycle our own technology. It is absolutely vital for us to do that. I don't know the answer, but my favorite quotation in this part of the lecture is, I seek not the answer, but to understand the question. We're here to decide what the problems actually are. And I love this quotation so much that I decided I wanted to know who first said it. So where do you go? You go to Google. Where else? And when I did it and looked up, I discovered it was me. <laughs> I'd said it so often that Google decided that I'd originated this brilliant thing. Well, but if you change it slightly, uh, then you actually get a little bit further back in time. You discover it's Kung Fu. Okay, which is good. The answer, we do need to know what those questions are. And saving the planet will require us to change society and its habits. Let's think about society, and perhaps you yourselves think about some of the issues that I think concern me. If we want to save the rainforest, we must teach our children to love trees as much as wild animals and their pets. Okay? But do they love animals? It's an interesting question. Um, I thought, think you should think about this. Fish is still alive. Imagine that doing this whilst you don't have a sedation. Okay. And the problem is that fish don't have an, a, a vocal cord. So they can't squeal as your pet kitten would if you hooked it in the mouth and swung it round. Okay. This is sort of damage. And there have been neurological studies of fish, and they feel pain just as much as you do and just as much as your pet animal does. I wonder if these kids would be smiling if those fish were actually squealing like cats. Just something to think about it. If you want to learn more about fish and pain, animalsaustralia.org is where that came from. Father and son bonding. Well, this guy's just shot a bear, and I don't think he's going to eat it, right? Just look at that magnif magnificent animal. It's unfair advantage, okay? Father and son bonding, what are they like? Well, they just shot a deer. Deer aren't easy to, are easy to shoot. This fish, huge fish, happy about it. It's easy to shoot a sheep, isn't it? Think about it, okay? And there's another way to bring out <coughs> our children, and that is to work with them to mend their bicycles, make things and mend stools, or work in the garden, or shoot animals with a camera. So the animals. <laughs> That's something I want you to think about when you have children. There are other problems that we face. Population growth. Five million, 30,000 years ago. A billion in 1830. This is a frightening number. Really frightening. 
No technology can save us from unfettered population growth on a planet with limited resources. And that's Malthus quite a while ago. And my logo for a conference on the population explosion. There are other things to think about. Mystical and political dogma. We, Margaret and I, live in Lewis, three months a year, based there. And here it is, directly south of London. In fact, zero longitude goes through the field opposite our house. I was hoping it would go through our house so I could cross it every morning. <laughs> this is where we live. There are white cliffs, uh, just the Seven Sisters near Eastbourne. On a good day, the castle in, the, in Lewis. But in these arches is a, is a painting there on the left-hand side. And it's Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine lived in this house for about uh, a dozen years. And he used to go to this pub, the White Hart. Um, and in fact, uh, his influence on the Enlightenment has been tremendous. Okay? This is where he used to debate. There was a debating society there. Okay? And th this is the White It's actually a Best Western now. Okay? And in this room, where I've spoken on about Thomas Paine in America, he actually honed his views on the rights of man. He was a great guy. And on the, on the wall is the US Constitution, or the Declaration of Independence. And his writings influenced the American Revolution. I'd like to read one of the great statements. You will do me justice to remember that I've always supported the right of man to his own opinion, however different that opinion be from mine. He who denies to another this right makes a slave of himself to his present opinion, because he precludes himself the right of changing it. Science is very important because we leave ourselves open, as I said. Unfortunately, pain could not awaken the Americans to this destruction that was their love affair with the biblical institution of human slavery, until Abraham Lincoln read Paine's writings as a young man and had thus been duly inspired to struggle for change. He came to America, and you should read about Thomas Paine. Because it influenced people like Jefferson, who said this, because religious belief or non-belief is such an important part of a person's life, freedom of religion affects every individual. State churches that use government power to support themselves and force their views onto persons of other faiths undermine our civil rights. Erecting the wall of separation between church and state, therefore, is absolutely essential in a free society. In fact, this is his tombstone. The Declaration of Independence, the author, the father of the University of Virginia, and originator of the Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom. He doesn't say he was President of the United States. I suspect the only President who doesn't have that there. These are important issues. My favorite President is Madison, the fourth President, father of the Constitution. More than any other, he was responsible for the form of the First Amendment. And the most important document, as far as I'm concerned, is the Memorial and Remonstrance of the Commonwealth of Virginia. We, the subscribers, citizens of the said Commonwealth, have taken into serious consideration a bill printed by order of the last session of the General Assembly, entitled, A Bill Establishing a Provision for Teachers of Christian Religion. And conceiving that the same, if finally armed with the sanctions of law, will be a dangerous abuse of power and are bound as faithful members of a free state to remonstrate against it and to declare the reasons by which we are determined we remonstrate against the said bill. Because we hold it for a fundamental and undeniable truth that religion or duty which we owe to our Creator and the manner of discharging it can be directed only by reason and conviction and not by force or violence. The religion then of every man must be left to the conviction and conscience of every man. And it is the right of every man to exercise it as they may dictate. The civil government functions with complete success by the total separation of the church and state. That's a statement by your fourth president. And I think it's a very important one. The free thinking nations. It's interesting to look at this. Who are these where basically more than 50% are atheists, agnostics, or have no belief in God? Well, the top ones are Sweden, Vietnam, Denmark, Norway, and Japan. The UK comes in down here. But where does the USA come? Well, let's look at this. Right at the bottom. 
Now, what the situation is that when you go to another country, you should think about it that a lot of people may think differently from you. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't understand something about religion, because I know a lot about it. This is an amazing story. Alan Crotzer spent 24 years in a Florida jail for a crime he did not commit and was freed on DNA evidence. Okay. Here he is. He said it's been a long time now. He's a remarkable guy, a remarkable guy. I heard him speak when he came out, the day he came out. Imagine 24 years in a Florida jail for a crime he did not commit. How would you react? Well, I thank God for this day. His faith kept him going, kept him a decent human being. But science got him out. And in fact, here is Alec Jeffries, a friend of mine, who developed DNA fingerprinting. Science has the ability to make humanitarian contributions to society. So when you visit these countries, remember, they may think different, according to Apple grammar. If you, English grammar is think differently. Okay, all right, just in case you didn't. The second dark age. Every day we hear evidence that powerful forces which depend on dogma for their authority are insinuating themselves into the very fabric of our global society. These forces are openly aiming to undermine the democratic principles, personal freedoms, and rational free thinking, which have combined to create the modern, enlightened, humanitarian society, and are necessary for social, cultural, and scientific progress. And for, actually, they are necessary, but they're not sufficient. Unless this advancing, destructive tide of irrationality is confronted and defeated decisively, the world will be dragged back into a second dark age. The enlightened world has been blind to this threat and will have to wake up if the enlightenment is to be saved. Nuclear proliferation. We are in a pretty tricky time. And I want you to think as scientists, that many of you are, and may, will become, that you have a responsibility. And there are organizations working on this responsibility. And one of them is this one, and I'm a member of this particular one. The International Network of Engineers and Scientists for Global Responsibility. If you become a physicist, we don't need any more atomic bombs. There are 28,000 of them, at the, or maybe more now. There are 3,500 that can be set off within the next 45 seconds. So who's thinking? There are 3,500 atomic bombs that can be set off within 45 seconds of now. Start counting. If you're a chemist, I am one of the greatest problems I have is that the book that I really loved when I was at school called Organic Chemistry by Fieser and Fieser was written by the guy who invented napalm. We don't need any more napalm. This iconic image, I think, is one that you need to think about when we sort of work on and go into the future. I try to avoid working on things of that nature. Engineer, we don't need any more landmines. You only have to look at YouTube and see little kiddies somewhere in the world on crutches, one with one leg, playing soccer, dreaming of going to the paraplegic Olympic Games. The leg, one leg blown off by a landmine they're all over the place. And many of them were created in Britain and the USA. We don't need any more landmines. There's a responsibility that I feel we should share. Leon Lederman wrote to me a few months ago and said, Harry, will you say this to young people whenever you lecture? So many years have passed, and the human race is still saddled with enough nuclear weapons to destroy the planet. We must redouble our efforts to unify the scientific community against this huge stupidity. We're only 1%. We've got to unify the whole community. We're only 1% who really understand just how horrible these weapons actually are. Joe Rotblatt became a close friend in the last few years of his life. When he was 97 when he died a few years ago. He was a really great man. He was one of only perhaps one or two people who left the Manhattan Project before the bomb was completed and when it was clearly not necessary and before the war was over. As soon as he realized that Hitler did not have the bomb, he walked out of that project and he had a lot of problems. He got the Peace Prize with Pugwash for his work on trying to stop the proliferation of nuclear weapons. And I want to read from his Nobel address. 
We appeal as human beings to human beings. Remember your humanity and forget the rest. If you can do so, the way lies open to a new paradise. If you cannot, there lies before you the risk of universal death. The quest for a war-free world has a basic purpose, survival. But if in the process we learn how to achieve it, by love rather than by fear, by kindness rather than by compulsion, if in the process we learn to combine the essential with the enjoyable, the expedient with the benevolent, the practical with the beautiful, this will be an extra incentive to embark on this great task. Above all, remember your humanity and forget the rest. And here's Joe in his office. I, you couldn't find him in his office. There were so many papers, 50, 60 years of working to stop the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Many great statements, statesmen came to his funeral. And here, look at this. How is that staying up? <laughs> that was Joe, a lovely guy, a great man, one of the just two or three heroes. I don't think one should have heroes, really, but if they have a hero, he is mine. My favorite poster is this by Stein. Found it in California one time when we were playing. I am an alien creature. I was sent from another planet with a message of goodwill from my people. The message says, dear Earth people, when you finally at last destroy your planet, and have no place to live, you can come and live with us. And we will teach you how to live in peace and harmony. And we will give you a coupon, good for 10% of all deep dish pizzas to Sincerely Bob. <laughs> now, three things. Destroy the planet. I don't know, but it don't look good. I know this one, peace and harmony. It is incredible in the 21st century with weapons of mass destruction that our politicians cannot, I mean, how many are there? Two or three hundred? Cannot sit down in a room to discuss our problems without sending young people to go and kill each other. It is pretty incredible when you think about it. It's only 300. And young people today are dying in Afghanistan and all over the world because our politicians, the people that we elect in general, cannot sit down in a room to discuss the problems. That's the point. But in the end, there's a sense of humor in a pizza. Okay. Without a sense of humor, life just isn't worth living. So that's basically it. Leonard Cohen in Rome says, I don't consider myself a pessimist. I think of a pessimist as someone who's waiting for it to rain, and I'm soaked to the skin. Well, you know, basically, I'm an optimist. I should be well out of here when the shit hits the fan. <laughs> there we are. Thank you very much.